Truett, as the guy who fried the, per, the first piece of chicken, I mean, you, you get all this credibility and authority that comes with being a founder to go against the grain. Uh, Truett uh, passed several years ago, and, and now Chick-fil-A is continuing to thrive. How did you, because that's still there. Yes. So how did you see Truett instill this mindset into yes. the next generation of leadership? Great question. And this is where culture comes in handy because cultures are generally built around a purpose, but also a lot of values and how-tos. I think sometimes a good way to define a culture, it's the Chick-fil-A way of doing things. It's the you know, Dave Ramsey way of doing things. It's what is your company's way of doing things? And usually the Chick-fil-A way is that 20% because 80% of what we do mm -hmm. is the exact same as everyone else. So I think they understand the, the importance of culture. But they also understand the importance of retooling a culture. Like, let me give you an example. A number of years ago, uh, Truett and Dan, this is probably more Dan than Truett, really, decided we wanted to be an innovative company. And not just have an innovation department. We wanted innovation to be in the DNA of Chick-fil-A. And so we went on a, a, a big journey to create an innovation center that I told you about before and create innovation training and all the, all these things. But really what we're trying to do is not have a, a couple of smart people that were the innovators. It's how do we make innovation part of the entire DNA of the organization? How do we make it a foundational value in the organization? And I can tell you, if you'd come to Chick-fil-A 20 years ago, you know, you would have seen a sleepy Southern fried chicken company. Mm. But if you came today, which we have like students all the time, they're like, I expected a Southern fast food company. This looks like Apple or Google to mm -hmm. me. Literally, I think if you came on our campus, well, you, I think you may have been to our campus, but particularly yeah. the innovation, you'd say, this doesn't seem like a fast food company. This seems like a high tech innovation company like Apple or Google or, you know, you fill in the blank. And it does, Bec but it, it didn't happen by default. In fact, 20 years ago, you would not have felt that way. But it was designed into the DNA and it became part of the culture and became part of what we're all about. And now it's part of how we attract great people because great people want to be part of great things going on. So we know that Chick-fil-A is an amazing organization. If you watch the highlight reel, you go multi-billion dollar company, one, one generation in, they're succeeding at levels that most people never even dream about. Yet we know that it hasn't always been up and to the right. Mm -mm. There's been mistakes. There's been setbacks, challenges. What were some of the inflection points when things were really tense mm. and it, it wasn't all my pleasure and this right. is going great, right. but it, it, the executive team is nervous yes. and maybe not even aligned about the future? Yeah. Well, I can give you a couple of examples, but I want to make a comment about your question generically. Here was one of the interesting things. You know, when I went to work for Chick-fil-A, I told you, I, I didn't take a, a, a cut in pay, but I was being offered half of what I could have made other places. For probably the first 15 years, maybe 20 years of my career at Chick-fil-A, almost everyone who came took a cut in pay to come. There was a whole season when almost everybody, because other people had more money, they were more well-heeled, and the people who came to Chick-fil-A would have to take a cut in pay. Really? For the first probably 10 or 15 years of my career at Chick-fil-A, you know, our operators get paid based on their bottom line. Mm -hmm. We share 50-50, the bottom line. For the first probably 15, maybe 20 years of my career at Chick-fil-A, at any point in time, about a third of our operators were not profitable and they were having to live off what Truett called bread and water money. And we were having a hard time attracting people to that. But I'll tell you, that became the foundation for the success today. Hmm. Uh, because you had people that were more motivated by the mission than the money. And we easily screened out people who it was all about the money because we didn't have any to offer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great filter. But they were really <laughs> attracted to the mission. And I say this because you mentioned a lot of your listeners are smaller business. Mm. That's almost a great time. At Rome, my small business, almost everybody there took a cut and pay to come because they saw something there they wanted to be part of. I worry now for Chick-fil-A, kind of fast forwarding, now it's so attractive financially, I worry the other end. Mm -hmm. That instead of attracting people willing to sacrifice and people, you know, coming for the mission, there's so much money involved now 
that could easily come for the money. A, a 23 year old kid could graduate from college, become a Chick fil A operator, yeah. and make half a million dollars their first year. Where that never would have happened. I feel the same exactly. tension here. You know, when I started at Ramsey, I mean, we were making that bread and water money. Yeah. You know, and our parking lot had cars because everybody's on the Dave Ramsey plan and paying off their debt and driving used cars. I mean, our parking lot was full of oil stains, you, you know, beat up, used, you mm -hmm. know, cars that you would be, you know, embarrassed to drive, but we didn't mm. care because, man, yes. we were doing something that mattered and yes. we were on this crusade and this mission. And now. Bingo man, we've got this beautiful building and we've got all this talent and technology and we're sitting, you and I are right now in this, you know, million dollar studio that I never dreamed. Our mm. first studio was a closet that we that we stole from another team because they were using it for storage and we went mm. back in there and we set up a microphone and we turned on mm. it, the computer and it was just like, okay, this is going to be our podcast. Mm. And today we've got all this luxury. Mm -hmm. And David, when people get hired in today, they don't understand where what we had to sacrifice mm. to get here. And it's really, you can tell the story, but it's difficult, yes. you know, to get them to feel, mm. you know, this is, a, this is a platform that has been built through blood and sweat and tears. And, you know, they're standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm. And I don't know exactly how you prevent that, that it's a paradox, right? Because yes, all the fruit so. of the work it is now something everybody can enjoy, but they miss the lesson of the pain and the sacrifice well, it took well, to get part there. Part of what you got to do is early on, you don't really have to screen for the mission mode because they're not going to come if they're all about money and uh -huh. you don't have it to offer. Exactly. But I think where a lot of people trip up is later on, you do have to set new things in motion when you do have a lot to offer. But let me share with you a little uh, analogy that somebody shared with me one day that has been super helpful uh, to me and I hope to you and a lot of your listeners. They said the founder of any organization builds a fire and you know when they're first building the fire they got the little kindling and the flint and you mm. know just a you know a little grass there and they got it, you know and they're sweating over just creating a little fire and then you start to add some sticks and then you start to add some logs and before you know it you have this blazing fire but the founder loves the fire well the next generation comes in and they love the benefits of the fire. Mm. They love the fact that it will heat your water and, you know, cook your food and heat the house. And they fall in love with the benefits of the fire. Well, the next generation comes in. I'm thinking of an organization. And they fall in love with the benefits of the benefits. And like at Chick-fil-A, they fall in love with the fact we have daycare, we have a health club, we have free lunches Parks. every day and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, free parking and all this stuff. And they fall in love with the benefit of the benefit. And the, and the problem with that is sometimes when you get to that third generation that fell in love with the benefit of the benefit, they actually don't like the fire anymore. Mm. So let me give you an actual example where I saw this play out at Chick-fil-A. Uh, we now open a lot of college campuses. And when we open on college campuses, um, we typically do it through a third-party vendor, somebody like a Marriott or an ARA that owns the rights. Mm -hmm. But we'll invite alumni of that college from Chick-fil-A that work on Chick-fil-A to come to the opening. So we had an opening out in Texas, and we invited some of our home office staff to this opening. And one of our operators went up to these young people, and they were super sharp, amazing, talented, gifted leaders. And he went up to them and he said, gosh, you're exactly what I'm looking for to work in my restaurant, to be leaders in my restaurant, to groom as the next opera of my restaurant. He said, what would it take for you guys to come work for me and you know, be a leader? He said, help me understand what it would take to get people like you. You know what their reaction was? Ooh, hmm. I don't want to be around chicken all day and I don't want to smell like chicken and I don't want to bread the food. You know, it's almost like they were repulsed by the mm. idea of working in the restaurant. And they, they've lost the love for the fire. They've lost sight of, that's the fire. And you lose all the benefits. of the benefit. They got real excited about the beautiful building and all the benefits. Yeah, they're in the, the ivory office. tower. Yeah. But, but ultimately, you got to have a culture that everyone loves the fire. Because if you get too many people who love the benefits of the benefit and too few people who love the mm -hmm. fire, guess what happens to the fire? The fire goes out. Bingo. So third generation. And th this isn't necessarily just... I'm not talking about necessarily the family. I mean, this, it's just this could be over generations time. of yeah, employees just, over time. Yeah. How do you get them? I mean, you, you, obviously you have to hire for that. Yes. The best you can filter and screen for that. But even just in their day-to-day, -day, in ensuring that – I remember in, in our case, uh, back in the day, we would do these live events, and we still do live events, so that, lots of them. Um, but we didn't have a big shipping department. And so when we were loading up the truck – to go out all the merch and everything that would go in the box mm. truck to send out to a live event. 
there'd be a call over the inter- intercom that everybody go to shipping and Dave Ramsey himself and all of us are down there doing the train of boxes, mm-hmm. loading up the truck and it'd be hot and we'd be sweaty. We'd be in our work clothes and we'd come back to our desk drenched. You get on a sales call and you're, <sighs> and they're, you okay? Yeah, we're just loading the truck, you know? And there was a day we had enough money to outsource to a fulfillment organization. They loaded the truck and it was more efficient. It was the right decision. But I'm going, how do we get people that are being hired today mm. to have the equivalent of loading the truck? Yes. What's the solution? How do, you, how do you get them plugged into some of those early shaping, forming stories that really made you care about the fire? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, Chick-fil-A has an incredibly high engagement rate. You know, a lot of people nowadays talk about uh, th- this is very popular in business. I want, I want highly engaged employees. Uh, I think highly, and, and, and they're saying, mine are not very engaged. How do I do that? Well, I actually think you need to hire for engagement. Mm-hmm. You want higher H-I-G-H-E-R engagement? You got to hire for engagement. So I think it all begins in the hiring process that the people you bring in are people who love to serve other people. People who that's what they're passionate about. That's what they're energized by. And so you've got people, if they can't go load the truck, you got to give them other avenues to be able to serve others. I, I remember uh, an ad I saw one time for a, ho- a hotel chain, and it said, we don't teach our people to be nice. Big letters, you know, three quarters of a page. We don't teach our people to be nice. And in the bottom, small letters, we just hire nice hire people. Nice people. And so I think a lot of that, starts in the hiring process. And if you don't have what you what you want now, the next hire better be what you want. Mm. The next hire better be. You know, you can start to hire all that in and then you give them opportunities to exhibit that. And if it's not loading the truck, there's always other things where people need help. And mentoring, you know, the more senior people mentor, the more mm-hmm. junior people, that there's always this spirit of service. And we do a lot of community service activities you know, in all the organizations, that's another venue for that to come out. But if you, it's almost like leaders have to leave. You know, every leader I know has to lead. It's like, the, it's, they just can't help they it. They can't help it's it. It's who they are. Well, I think people who have a servant's heart have to serve. Yeah. They can't help it. That's good. But it's hard to train for that. Mm-hmm. You got to hire for that. Mm-hmm.